I think it's a really good topic to discuss with everyone. We've kind of run into it a little bit more over the years, um, especially being a vendor. People are constantly calling, wanting to know what to do with their pigs when they need to socially house them. Um, I guess I want to start off with a couple disclaimers. This is not going to be as good as the last two presentations. Um, and I'm also not here trying to do a sales pitch. You know, we've put a lot of time and effort into our behavior system, and we've always had to social house animals. Um, we have from the start, all of our animals are group housed, and um, there's some tricks and things that you can do to try and make it easier at your institutions. And that's what we aim to do for our clients. And hopefully I can uh, give some suggestions here today to help you uh, ease the transition in your facilities. So we'll start off a little bit with the origin, origin of swine, um, some of their natural behavior, um, some of the natural versus the laboratory behavior that you'll see in them, um, their psychology, cognition, their social, social communication, and some abnormal behaviors that you might see. Um, a lot of times you can correct those behaviors with uh, behavioral conditioning. Um, that way you, don't, you, start, you stop bad habits before they start. Um, swine are not native to the American continent. Um, the Polynesian immigrants brought the first domestics to Hawaii in approximately AD 750. And swine have always been viewed as an agricultural animal. Um, everyone's raised them for meat. It wasn't until Probably the early 40s and 50s where smaller breeds of feral swine were being used for research in facilities where they didn't have a lot of room and they noticed that the domestic pigs were growing faster. So there's been several breeds that have been uh, purpose bred, I guess, for the, for the purpose of research f facilities. Um, matter of fact, the Yucatan started out in the U.S. with just 25 brought to the University of Colorado and then they kind of propagated from there. Um, the wild boar is the ancestor of all the domestic breeds of swine. Um, Sus scrofa is their scientific genus. Um, they're not as gregarious in the wild as you see in commercial farms. Um, the sows tend to stay together, but the boars are solitary. They kind of roam by themselves. In a commercial setting, you really don't see that a lot because uh, commercial farms don't have a lot of intact boars. On the research side, though, toxicology studies demand that you have intact animals split gender for all of your study needs, so you have to try and figure out how to group those animals. Um, a lot of the purebred pigs, Landrace, Yorkshire, Hamps, um, some of those genes were introduced into the miniature breeds way back, whether it was for color or to uh, get along the domestic side a little more. Um, most of that's been bred out of them now. Most of the miniature pigs started off from feral crosses, um, especially the Sinclair and the Hanford, which were originally Hormel's. Um, they're just a cross of four feral breeds of pigs. They just happen to stay smaller. Those in the Vietnamese potbelly pigs are uh, some of the early lines that you would see. Um, you can see the difference in their phenotype. Obviously, when they domesticated pigs, um, they the whole purpose was for weight gain. Um, so they lost a lot of the traits that their wild ancestors did. Um, their skull shape, their, their phenotype in general is just a lot different. Um, and actually, for a lot of internal studies, the um, Feral pigs are a little bit better for certain things. They have a longer jaw structure for dental implants. Um, and they, they just don't grow as fast, so it's a lot nicer. Um, they're bullet shaped, that way they can move through the underbrush when they were in the wild. Um, their speed and agility for short distance. Uh, pigs are a natural prey animal, so they're constantly on, on the lookout for any predator which kind of correlates into the laboratory sometimes. If you've noticed, um, if you don't get an animal that's very well socialized, um, they will try to run from you or run past you, if any of you have ever worked with pigs. Um, pigs are omnivorous. Uh, we talked about gregarious, gregariousness earlier. Um, they like to be in large groups. And as I said, we raise all of our animals in large groups. Um, from the time they're six months old on up, sometimes there's 20 or 30 in one pen and uh, they get along just fine. 
and we realize that most research facilities don't have that type of space. So what happens when they get to your facility? I urge a lot of you to contact your vendors or work closely with your vendors because this isn't all on you to social house these animals. If you need them in groups of two or three, let your vendor know and that can be done prior. You talked about the uh, rabbits earlier. We can select animals from a pen of 20 and you may get you know, eight animals that were in the same pen that we could double house and they'll be fine once you receive them. Um, it's just, I think, more communication with your vendors on what you need will be really helpful. And then you also need to talk to your study directors more too, I think, in designing the protocols. Um, a lot of the study directors don't realize what the client, the, or the, the client may need something and then the study director says, yeah, we can do this. Well, once you talk to your vendor and they're like, well, no, we can't have four pigs per pen, um, but we can do groups of two. So there has to be a clear line of communication between everyone on what the whole purpose is. Um, some of the natural behavior, pigs like to root. How many of you here have had pigs in your facilities? How many have had your facilities destroyed by pigs? <laughs> they, uh, they will tear up an anvil in a sandbox, as I've heard a lot of people say. Um, and it's just because they get bored. So you have to make sure you provide plenty of enrichment so they can do those natural behaviors that have come to them. Um, we make a lot of rooting boxes from different material. Um, if they find anything loose in their pen, though, they're going to play with it, and they'll just play with it and play with it and play with it until it either comes off or something falls over. Um, and that's just what they do naturally. That's how they get their food. Um, so the regulatory guidelines for laboratory swine, um, the guide says housing space or enclosure should account for animal social needs. Social animals should be housed in stable pairs or larger groups of compatible individuals. The question that I get a lot from people is, what do you consider compatible individuals? Well, if we're talking to you and we house them prior to shipping in, in a group of two, um, we've already defined that those animals are compatible. Now, if you tell us after the fact, then we may have, we can give you the original, the original pen housing groups, but from the time that you separate that animal out of that pen, say you ship it in an individual carrier to your facility, they've already lost the compatibility just over that short trip that they may have had. It won't, they won't be as aggressive towards each other once they get there, but there's still going to be a little bit of a scuffle. And most times that can't be avoided. Um, pigs have a very strong hierarchy of structure. And once that's disrupted, they have to figure out how to get that back in balance, whether it's two pigs, whether it's eight pigs, then whether it's pen writing, um, biting, nibbling on the ears, whatever it's going to be, they have to reestablish that structure. But we can minimize that by putting them in groups prior to shipment or doing other things once they get to your facility that will overshadow their fears. And then uh, you can work with them on a normal basis and try and reintroduce them. The need for social housing should be reviewed on a regular basis by the eye cook and the veterinarian. Your eye cook should have your social housing statement written at your facility. Um, a lot of people aren't used to how pigs react. So if a veterinarian sees a scratch on the pigs, they automatically say they're incompatible. That's not always the case. Um, you have to find that fine line of the, the scratches and abrasions that you're gonna be okay with that are treatable, that aren't gonna affect your study, and that don't cause any stress or harm to the animals. Um, pigs, especially the Yucatan, since they don't have any hair to protect them, they, uh, they get scratched up pretty easily. Um, and it's just part of their normal life. Now, if it's for a dermal study, like we were discussing earlier with the rabbits, you don't see it until after you've shaved them. That's another issue altogether. But uh, if it's something that you can treat while they're in acclimation, you have perfect skin at time of dosing, then there shouldn't be any issue rehousing those animals. Um, the biological basis for this all starts in the embryo. Pigs are in competition with each other from the time they're conceived. Um, and it first starts even more when they're born. So when a piglet's born, they have to fight for that hierarchical structure to get the best milk provided from the sow. Um, so within the first couple hours, you'll see piglets just 
box, we call it boxing, and they will fight each other until that order is established. And they maintain that order throughout their whole life cycle. Um, unless you reintroduce pigs or one pig maybe gets larger and decides that it needs to be the alpha in the pen. Um, typically, the dominant pigs will eat faster. So if you've got pair housed animals in your facility and uh, you notice one is getting larger, you might want to make sure they have enough feed bowls in their pens because the other one's obviously eating before the other one can. Um, just normal behaviors of pigs, they're scavengers, they're foragers, they move around and, and look for whatever they can find. And you'll notice that in their setting. Um, whenever you feed the pigs, they'll eat a little bit and then they'll kind of move back to the corner. Um, they really do it with water. They, they take three or four bites of feed and then they run to the water. And uh, that's just, they're constantly on the move and constantly on the lookout. Um, abnormal behaviors that you might see are conflicts between the animals. Um, there may be a genetic or abnormality that's causing them to be more um, aggressive than domestic pigs are because there are a lot of feral crosses in these early early lineages. So uh, we've also looked at the, uh, the Siberian fox theory and um, years ago I've also tried to introduce behavior into our breeding scheme and it's just a simple one to three score if they approach you they don't approach you or if they're they're wary of you and um, we started selecting our breeders based on a lot of that to try and get more docile animals that you guys as the end users can socialize or train for procedures or whatever you need to do and that they're socially compatible with each other so in the in the wild you'll see a lot of rooting behavior food seeking um, they like to dig holes in the mud like I said, in the laboratory, you'll see gates and, and cage doors lifted off the hinges, all sorts of banging around, uh, damage to the floors and the cage walls. Um, the social order, once you switch them, if you're doing a neonatal study and you try and move some pigs around, you'll, they'll have to reestablish that dominance again. Um, after weaning, usually if you regroup the animals, the subordinates are attacked when they're reintroduced. Um, there's not much you can do except separate them. Um, usually it's short-lived though, so that's the good news. Um, and rarely in, in younger animals, and I would say under six to eight months is what we would call younger, um, are you going to get a lot of actual physical damage. It's the older intact males that you usually have to worry about or the older sows. Um, when you're designing your, your facilities, um, make sure if you are going to be a swine facility that you uh, design your pens and gates that it's not going to damage the animal or your facility and make sure you keep that social housing in mind um, if you're going to renovate your animal space and uh, you know that all these these species are going to have to be group housed now keep that in consideration and uh, if you've got room maybe to make your hallway smaller so that the animal area is bigger um, Things like that really help the animals um, get away from each other and give them that little extra space that they need. Uh, chew distractions, like I said, pigs get bored easily, um, especially when they're by themselves. Um, we always have chains or some sort of enrichment in the pens, um, along with the human interaction that you give them on a daily basis. Um, usually the puberty is three to four months old in in miniature swine anyway, and then uh, four to five months old, we say they're sexually mature. Females is a little bit earlier. You don't get as much aggressiveness with them. The thing about uh, miniature swine with the feral uh, tendencies is in the intact males, they develop an armor, which I've never seen in a domestic pig, but an intact male will have probably a six to eight inch thick callus that starts at his shoulder and runs all the way back to his ribs. And that's to pr protect their vital organs in the wild when they fight, because that's naturally what the males will do. Um, so if once you start getting intact males that age, you have to be really careful if you're gonna try and introduce them. And I don't recommend it over the age of 10 months old, um, unless that they were, they were litter mates or pen mates prior to that. Um, you also have to be care careful with sexually mature males jumping over pens. Uh, females will do it as well, um, and they'll just hop from pen to pen trying to find an intact female, and you may get an inadvertent fight or an inadvertent housing um, issue that you didn't want. 
Um, pigs have excellent memories. Um, they remember where they got their food. Um, in the wild, when they are scavenging, they, they have their hot spots where they have to go back and forth all the time. And they just have a really good memory and they have a really good ability to learn things. Um, I think it would be interesting to see the pig on the chart up there with the dogs because I think that uh, somewhere along the line they have the, the better cognition than any of the other species as well. Um, they also learn avoidance really well. So if there's a negative stimulus in the area, they're going to avoid that at all costs. So you have to counter that with uh, positive reinforcement no matter what you do. Um, their sight's not as good as their smell, but it does does help. Their hearing is really well, high and low frequencies. Uh, they respond well to human voice. And uh, we've actually found in some of our farrowing houses that you, you have a lower pre-weaning mortality if you play a classical music versus a lot of the other sound that's around. Um, there are studies that have been done in dairy cattle as well that uh, show increased milk production, but I believe the, uh, the music of choice there was classic rock. It actually showed more milk production than classical. So, um, Pigs are very tactile as well. Um, they respond to touch, pressure. Um, they're very thermoreceptive. Um, if you see a lot of fighting in a pen of pigs, uh, you want to make sure you spread out their feeding areas because they, they produce a lot of heat, especially when they're eating. And that little bit of agitation, you know, it's like all of us being on a crowded bus. Um, somebody's going to get angry eventually, and then uh, that's when they start fighting over resources. Um, they always compete for, for fresh water. Um, their food selection is kind of varying. They like sweet things. They like some things that are bitter. Um, I'm sure everyone has tried their different treats at their facilities. Uh, we did a test of 45 different things just to see which ones they liked, and it was different between every breed, but uh, they all really liked Fig Newtons. I don't know if anyone's tried that, but uh, it makes a, a good enrichment. Um, so they have a very unique, I don't know if anyone's ever, uh, I'm sure most of the vets here have cut down the uh, turbinates of a pig and, and seen how uh, complex their nasal system is. Um, their sinuses um, continue up, almost take up more of their brain space than the rest of it. Um, and their VNO actually has two openings in the roof of their mouth. So we thought several years ago that Maybe we could keep pigs from fighting if we blocked that VNO. Um, and it was semi successful. Uh, we took a group of eight animals and um, actually plugged the VNO and then uh, kept them separate for three weeks and then we re reintroduced them. And uh, it seemed to work for a while, but you can't really block the whole VNO. It's too complex of a cavern to do without uh, something very invasive when they're younger. Um, so that's something that we're still looking at, and hopefully we can publish some data on later. Um, abnormal behaviors. Usually when you're, you're in the research facility, you'll see the regular stereotypic things. Um, the pigs will circle in their pen, or they'll chew incessantly on things. Um, it's just mainly because they're bored. Um, they do a lot of tongue play, and... Uh, that's what, what they do if they don't have anything else to do. Um, it's not that it's necessarily abnormal. Um, if they were in a group setting, they would probably just be doing it to each other instead of chewing on the pen. But uh, they're not violent about it if they're in a, uh, in a group where they've been raised that way. Um, and they actually, I don't want to say that they uh, groom each other, but pigs will chew on each other and they nudge each other and, and they all pile up in a pen like one big happy family. Um, usually these abnormal behaviors are caused by unsafe um, events, unpredictable events. Um, there's nothing that pigs seem to respond worse to than something they can't predict the outcome of. Um, from giving shots to dosing to anything that they're unsure about, um, they will react negatively until you show them that there's a positive side to it. And that's, that's the same for reintroduction. Um, if you take strange animals and put them together, they're going to see that as a negative stimulus. 
And until you show that there's a positive side to it, um, you're going to have trouble trying to get those group housed. That's why we always, time and time again, we ask when someone calls, you know, what's going to be your study? Are you going to group house them? Do you need them group housed? Um, and then we can go from there. But depending on your study, um, where I said earlier, the, the study directors have to talk to the IACUC and the veterinarian and the vendor. There are some talk studies where everybody needs to be single housed. If you had a dermal dose um, and you're collecting urine or whatever, you can't have five pigs in a pen. But if you're doing, let's say, an IV dose and you're just worried about the, the placement of a port or something like that, those animals could probably be regrouped later without any damage because uh, it's not going to cause a lot of issue. You just have to make sure that post-surgically or post-surgery, um, you separate them for a while until the suture line is healed. Um, that being said, we've also put, we've group housed some tox studies, or I've talked to clients that have group housed them and... Uh, the absorption rate wasn't known for oral ingestion and uh, they had really high spikes in their TK levels and come to find out the pigs were licking it off of each other and they weren't getting the dermal absorption, but it was really skewing the results from their, their TK. So you have to make sure that uh, the ends are what you need for when you start social housing these animals. Uh, there's a picture of one of our standard pens in the production setting, uh, they love to chew on the chains. Um, they chew on the feeders too, but the chains are their favorite toy. Uh, the intensity of regrouping fight increases with age and is usually gender dependent. Uh, the worst is intact males, particularly after puberty. Like I said before, I wouldn't regroup intact males that are 10 to 12 months old. Um, they're also going to have tusks along with that armor and they just have more testosterone and more of a drive to be the alpha. Um, you know, typically in the wild, they would be out on their own trying to find a, a herd of sows that is going to be theirs. Um, castrated males have minimum to no regrouping injuries, we found. Um, not even as much as females. Females are a little more tolerant, but they still may have some injuries. Um, mostly you're going to see scratches around the neck and the ears or on the dorsum from pen riding. Um, it's all going to vary. Uh, it varies on the individual. Uh, they're just like people. Each one's different. Um, as we talked about before, if you if you can, always house the pigs in their original pens. Um, that's where your vendor comes into play. Uh, that may be a little harder with rabbits and uh, some of the smaller animals, but large animals. Um, you can you can talk to your suppliers and tell them that you need them or you have to have the locations and they can give you that information. Um, sometimes this aggression when they are single housed um, can be turned towards the handlers. Um, sometimes headbutting of the handler that people see as play is actually an aggression by an intact animal. Um, and you can start bad habits, nuzzling or chewing on the handler's boots or clothes. Um, especially when you're trying to dermal dose an animal or you're getting anything out of the pen, um, they associate that with you and now that becomes a bad habit. So anytime anyone tries to get in that pen, um, uh, they're going to start chewing on you. That's not always the, the best thing for a lot of facilities. Um, many pigs are actually slight more, slightly more active than domestics. Um, and I think that's because they've got more room in their pens to move around. Um, they have a slower metabolism, so they just uh, kind of lay around, spend most of their time uh, eating and drinking, and then the rest of it sleeping. Um, it takes less than four weeks normally, if, if you take an unsocialized animal, to get them acclimated to your laboratory setting or to your technicians. They're, they're really fast at uh, picking up on where their resources are coming from and being rewarded for that and um, they react very positively. Um, these are the taller portitions we talked about. This is a typical, you know, maybe a research housing that you might see. Socialization, uh, which is a must in, in all 
facilities. Uh, it's minimally time consuming. Um, you can train the animals to practice the procedures. They like the treats. It's the best motivator. Um, a lot of pigs really actually have a sweet tooth. Uh, depending on your protocols, that may be good or bad. If you get a pig all sugared up, uh, they're just like a three-year-old. So eventually they'll crash. Um, but uh, <laughs> you can also buy certified treats from the different vendors. Um, vegetables, fruit, other things like that work really well. Um, I know a lot of our pigs we provide for diabetic clients feed uh, low glycemic treats, and uh, they work out really well too. The important thing is, whatever you're doing, you give the treat last, or the reward. You have to make them work for it. Um, they enjoy you know, chew toys and bedding. Um, chains are durable toys that they usually can't get, can't get bored of. Um, social group is the best enrichment. That's the best thing for them to do. Uh, human interaction is, I would say, number two on that list. Um, they're kind of like a dog with regards to once you have them trained to you coming in, scratching their belly and petting them on the back, they love that more than a food treat. You can see all the little Yucatans piled there with each other rather than playing with their toys. Um, they really find comfort in being in that group setting. So preventing abnormal behavior. Um, we talked about selective breeding a little bit earlier for behavior. Uh, making sure socialization, habituation, handling are all being taken care of at your facilities. And uh, leadership training for your technicians and the animals. Um, if you teach them that they have to work to provide, uh, or they have to work to get their rewards, it's going to um, make them more responsive in your, your, your study protocols. Um, the environment recognition by frequent regrouping of younger animals. Um, if you mix pigs as a different size, sometimes that helps as well. Although it doesn't work with pigs like it does in dogs, um, the larger animal isn't necessarily always going to be the dominant one. Um, there are some little feisty pigs that will just gnaw and gnaw and gnaw and gnaw like a little ankle biter. Um, exploratory behavior is self-rewarding. Um, we talked about the rooting boxes earlier. If you do have to single house your animals, you want to make sure that you're stimulating them mentally and giving them plenty of environmental enrichment and human interaction that uh, it makes up for that conspecific interaction. Uh, exercise training and obedience. Uh, you can do agility training, clicker training. Um, we do a lot of behavior enhancement for our clients and just in general um, to try and make our animals more docile. Um, but you can target train, you can sling train. Um, there's nothing really that I don't think you can teach a pig to do. Um, typically the, the abnormal things that you'll see, a pig bites to assert its dominance over a handler or another animal. Um, if it bites, it's because it's making the fear, the, the fear eliciting stimulus go away. So they know that's going to be a reward in itself. So if you respond when that animal's aggressive, they instantly think, oh, okay, well, that's how it makes it go away. Or that's how I make it, everyone go away instead of giving them something positive to look forward to. Um, so that's how a lot of bad behavior gets started in, in the research setting. Um, avoidance behavior in general, um, that's what pigs were bred to do. They're meant to survive, so you have to try and work around that. Um, and they, know, they pick up on the other animal's cues too in a social setting. If there's one pig in there that may be afraid of a caretaker or someone coming to the front of the pen, but you've got three other pigs coming up to the front, you're going to pick that pig up and he's going to become more social. Same way with moving pigs. I don't know if anybody's ever tried to herd pigs, but if you get one that stops at the door, nobody else is going through that door. Now that first one goes through and everybody will run right after it. Um, they really follow the group setting. So, um, you just have to try and be non-confrontational with them. Uh, positive reinforcement behaviors uh, work the best. Um, you can also habituate them, obviously, if uh, sling training. They kind of go hand in hand with the positive reinforcement. Um, they respond well to classical and operant conditioning. Um, 
strategies to reduce or prevent aggression. So this is what I deal with a lot on a daily basis, really, um, is clients wanting to regroup the animals. Say your study's ended and you have four animals that are open. What do you do with them now? You've lost that uh, single housing exemption from your IACUC. You've moved them to an open protocol. Now you have to throw four strange pigs back together. Um, where does that stop? And a lot of that's with your institution. Um, there may You may be able to exempt them based on incompatibility, but until you try, you're not sure if it's going to work or not. So we've developed some things that you can try and do uh, to minimize that if you have the time um, and you have the manpower. Um, aggression at regrouping, usually it's, it's a lot of biting and pen writing, but pigs are quick. Um, they can inflict up to 80 bites before the other one turns away or gives up. They're hard-headed. Um, and usually it's a fear, anxiety, or they want to establish that hierarchy. Um, we talked about the, the nursing and the teat order earlier. Um, that it, they come out being aggressive and uh, wanting to be competitive, so you have to overshadow that later in life. Um, and they're really possessive over their resources, especially food or water spaces. Um, and they're constantly on the move, being a forager. So when they do get in groups... Um, they like to groom each other, or when they do fight, they hit the same areas that they would be grooming, the flanks, the back, the belly, um, to try and get those subordinates to get away from their resource. Um, this is just a, an older picture I found of some common threatening body language. Um, usually you'll see the pigs, and they'll, they'll put their necks up to each other, and then they start what we call chomping, and they're working that salivary glands up and um, getting their pheromones spread out and once you start seeing that chomping behavior, it's time to interject because it's not going to be very much longer before they start chewing on each other or you um, if you try and get in the middle of it. So, um, Common threatening body language from that is usually because of invas invasion of space, um, a direct approach, an erratic movement. Um, if they notice something that moves really fast out of the corner of their eye, they're going to get defensive immediately. Um, or if someone else is trying to take their resources, they're really resource guarders. Um, some of it may be hormonal. Um, we talked about that earlier with the rabbits. Um, you'll see a lot more pen writing in the females when they're in estrus. Or if you have a room of females and there's an intact male in there, um, more boar exposure will bring those females into heat and then you'll start getting pen writing issues. That'll last for three or four days, and then it'll come back again in 21 days. So, um, Some of it can be pain-induced, um, depend on if it's post-surgery or if you're doing daily injections or um, just anything that's uncomfortable or abnormal to the animal, you'll start to get this aggression towards each other. Uh, we'd like to come up with some... Uh, acronyms for a lot of our clients so we like to use the uh, anxiety to calm and there's different tools that you can use um, to cover up the olfactory the visual the tactile the auditory um, you just want to make it safe and predictable when you try and put these animals back together um, we talked about the rooting boxes earlier um, that's something that we've introduced they don't seem to fight over it as much as a resource as it is something new and novel to them um, so if you have new pigs that have never seen each other you put them together and uh, they kind of both play around in there for a while and they don't really pay much attention to each other because it's something new um, here we have one of our technicians um, this is how we do a lot of our socialization socialization in a group setting um, they just sit in the pen and, and play with the animals now, these are the groups I was talking about earlier that are sometimes 15 to 20 animals. Um, what we would do in if a client called, we would select your animals, try and select them out of the same pen. Um, that way we could ship them in the groups that you requested. Um, enough time, If enough time is allowed, we would take animals from separate pens and then put them together and then uh, get them used to each other prior to shipment. 
Uh, some other things that we use are uh, catheter tip syringes filled with uh, sucrose or sweet water. Um, sometimes they just like to chew on the end of the syringe. Um, when you're reintroducing them, that kind of gives them something to focus on rather than each other. Um, mop heads on the end of the chains work really well. They, uh, they're they one-time use, obviously. They're not very sanitizable, but um, there's a picture of the rooting box. So we take a bunch of those plastic barbells that the rabbits love so much. Um, pigs like to move them around in there, too. And these two pigs here were single housed for probably 10 weeks. Um, this is their first introduction. Uh, they didn't really notice each other until all the food was gone. And then uh, that's when we had to separate them again. But you kind of have to do it in stages like that. If you're going to reintroduce um, naive animals to each other, it's uh, it's kind of like a play date or taking your kid to meet somebody new. You let them in there for a little while and then you separate them. Um, and you just keep keep mediating that until they finally can play in the sandbox together nicely. Um, we also start early with these animals trying to imprint that human interaction is nice and it's going to be positive for them. So we start with the sows and their litters. Um, we try to start mat training early. Uh, we do a lot of target training for individual clients and that really helps when you're regrouping these animals too. Um, if they perform on cue for you, um, you can set each one on the side, target train, and they know that they're going to get something positive out of it. And uh, it's really quite easy to start reintroducing them to each other that way. Um, sometimes when you're regrouping several animals at once, uh, it helps to kind of shock them. If you turn the lights off in the room immediately after you do it, um, they have to kind of focus on their surroundings rather than each other. Uh, there's a little bit of cage mate size disparity, but like I said, with pigs, it it doesn't matter a whole lot. Like it was, I know a lot. Of, I know a lot of people that would regroup dogs, and they'd put a bigger one with a smaller one on purpose, um, and then they wouldn't expect any fighting. That doesn't work as well with pigs. And then there's something that we've tried called the calming hood, and uh, it's worked pretty well. We've developed this over the last couple of years. Um, so these are the two pigs that were in the. Uh, they were in the rooting box earlier. So the pig on the left, uh, we noticed he was the aggressor and the other one was more submissive. And we thought, well, if they can't necessarily see each other, but they can still smell and touch, um, what's that going to do? Because we've kind of tried this before in slings. Um, you take away the sight and they calm down a little bit. Um, and they're just not as anxious. So I thought, well, we'll try this, uh, with a reintroduction and it worked pretty well, actually. Um, and I have a, a video clip of that later. But uh, some other things you can do. We've also used thunder shirts on pigs. Um, if you know, if you have one that's really anxious, um, our sling wrap, which actually works a little bit better than just a normal sling, um, it kind of it gives pressure to the animal, kind of like a thunder shirt would. And you can still manipulate them for you know port placement or whatever else you're doing in the sling. Um, lots of nesting and bedding stuff work too. Um, I know most facilities now are all washed down, so you probably don't have a lot of ability for nesting material. Um, but you can still put it in the rooting boxes and you just have to make sure it doesn't end up in your sewer system. So when we reintroduced these two, um, we decided, well, let's take the hood off of the submissive one and just leave it on the aggressive one and see what happens. And uh, it was really interesting. Like I said, you have to babysit the animals a lot. Um, so we've got our caretaker in there with them. But the positive interaction that they're getting just from the back scratching and the rubbing is enough to make um, these guys just lay down and uh, almost cuddle next to each other here in a couple minutes. And after about, a, I think it was four or five days, we were able to put these guys in a pen together. Um, after this first instance, we found that when we took the hood off the aggressive animal, he didn't care for it much. But as long as he couldn't see the other guy, 
they just kind of laid down there next to each other. So uh, it definitely works. Um, like I said, it's just time consuming, but if you have the time to do it, this is uh, one way that you can start regrouping them. Um, other things you can do, we talked about the classical conditioning, um, and that's done every day in most every facility I've seen. You can roll the food barrel down the hallway. You don't even have to walk in the room with it, and uh, everybody knows what's happening. Um, a lot of these can be grouped together. We've found uh, into different categories of things you can do. We also found uh, you can use an enzymatic cleaner um, to get rid of a lot of the olfactory smell on each other. So if you give both pigs a bath, um, it reduces their aggression quite a bit towards each other. And we've also used Vicks or something strong like that and, and kind of rubbed on their nose. And uh, it, it, it breaks down that barrier right at first. It lets them kind of see, hey, maybe this guy's not after my resources, so we're just going to get along. So there's different things you can try depending on your facility. And uh, a lot of them work really well. Usually the pigs are always biting or running because it's a fear response. Um, so that's one thing you have to make sure that you don't reinforce at your facilities when you're regrouping these animals. Um, any kind of fear response and, and it's not going to be easy. And I think that's it. <laughs>